Good afternoon. My name is Linda Levy, and I am the director of the JDC Global Archives. I am delighted to welcome you to the JDC Archives' fourth annual Helen Cohen Memorial Lecture. We are thrilled that so many of you have joined us this afternoon. First, a quick word about the JDC Archives. The JDC Archives holds the records of JDC since its founding about 107 years ago. Visiting scholars from around the world, as well as publishers, journalists, family researchers, curators, filmmakers, and others use our collections for their research. We also offer fellowships to enable scholars to conduct their research in the JDC archives. Today's program inaugurates a new JDC archive series on Jewish women in turbulent times changes, challenges, and opportunities, which will raise awareness about Jewish women's leadership and resilience in communities throughout the world during the 20th century. We will focus today on Helene Kazes Benatar, a highly regarded Jewish lawyer from Casablanca, who quickly claimed a role of rescuer and almost single-handedly organized a sweeping program of wartime refugee relief teaming up with JDC. Our speaker today, Dr. Susan Gilson Miller, is Professor Emerita of History at the University of California at Davis. She has a PhD in Modern Middle Eastern and North African History from the University of Michigan and is a historian of modern North Africa and the Mediterranean with a special interest in urban studies, minority studies, and most recently in humanitarian relief and human rights. She is the author of books on 19th and 20th century North African history, including Disoriented Encou Disorienting Encounters in 1992, In the Shadow of the Sultan in 1998, and the history of modern Morocco from, 19, uh, from 2013. Dr. Gilson Miller was the recipient of the Fred and Ellen Lewis JDC Archives Fellowship in 2012. Today, Dr. Gilson Miller will be discussing her new book, Years of Glory, Nellie Benatar and the Pursuit of Justice in Wartime North Africa, which was just published by Stanford University Press. Dr. Gilson Miller will begin with a presentation on the book and then will be in conversation with Dr. Isabel Rohr, Manager of Academic Programs and Outreach at the JDC Archives. The program will conclude with 15 minutes of Q&A. Please note that your microphones are turned off and we will take questions via the Q&A function. You can send us questions at any time during the lecture. Dr. Susan Gilson Miller will now give her presentation on Years of Glory, Nellie Benatar, and the Pursuit of Justice in Wartime North Africa. Hello, Linda. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. My uh, thanks to you and to the JDC for inviting me to give the Helen Cohen Memorial Lecture. It's a great privilege and an honor. Uh, I've had a uh, Many, many uh, interactions with the JDC over the years, starting in 2012, uh, when I began researching this book that I'm going to talk about today in the archives of the JDC itself. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Isabel Rohr, who's going my partner today in presenting this program. Isabel uh, is a historian of note, director of academic programs and outreach at, at the JDC, and she's very familiar with the topic uh, of this book. So it'll be a, a great conversation between us. I also wanna send greetings to friends across the world. It's really incomprehensible to me to be talking to people in the Europe, in the Middle East, uh, as well as in uh, the East Coast of America. I'm here in California uh, through the miracle of whatever, the internet. So let me talk a bit uh, about a Years of Glory and tell you, start off by uh, talking a bit about why I wrote this book. Uh, when I was researching my previous uh, publication, The History of Modern Morocco, a survey 
uh, of uh, Moroccan history in the 19th and 20th century, I was struck by the void uh, in the secondary sources about the history uh, of uh, the people of North Africa during World War II. While there were many books on the military aspects uh, of the war in North Africa, the famous Operation Torch, um, there were no, almost no uh, secondary sources on the social consequences of the war, on the impact of World War II on the people of the, uh, of the region. Uh, so I became very interested in this topic and decided to make it um, the topic, the subject of my next big research um, effort and uh, concentrate on the human aspects of the war in North Africa, especially its impact on North African Jews, how they were changed by their experiences during the war, their strategies for coping, their strategies for survival, their response to the news uh, and the trauma of the Holocaust, their memories and recollections, and the diverse ways that people Ordinary people responded to the devastating effect of World War II on their daily lives. So it was by chance that I fell on this subject, but I soon became obsessed with it because of the amount of material I found and because of the uh, opportunity for filling this uh, uh, obvious void uh, in the literature on the topic. The research took me a long time. Uh, I began in 2012, the book is published uh, last month, 10 years. During that period of research uh, and writing, I worked in 15 different archives, in person in Jerusalem, in Paris, in Rabat, in Nantes, uh, in New York City, in Washington DC for extended periods. Plus I worked in a number of other virtual archives online. By the end of my period of research, I'd gone through thousands of documents, held dozens of interviews, some in person, some in with viewing videos, as well as holding many conversations with friends, colleagues, uh, and family on many topics relating to my research, but mainly on the question of, of heroism and moral responsibility and how ordinary people cope with extraordinary situations that enter their lives unexpectedly. As a result of these conversations, I came to a better understanding of what I was writing about. The epigraph on the first page of Years of Glory sums it up, and I quote, Justice, justice thou shalt pursue. This is the quotation from the book of Deuteronomy that also hung in the chamber, the chambers of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the Supreme Court. I thought it suited the person I found myself writing about. A Moroccan Jewish lawyer, Elin Kazez Benatar, known as Nelly, a remarkable woman who risked her life to save others because she thought it was the right thing to do. Reading this book will introduce you to her and her path through the war, especially the years 1939, 1945. She is my central character. Nellie Benatar threw herself into the middle of the conflict and took many roles that we associate with Holocaust history and memory. She was a rescuer, a resistor, an organizer, a social worker, and a champion of human rights. Years of Glory will introduce you not only to Nelly Benatar, but to an array of characters, both good and evil, that Nelly encountered during her war years. They include French colonial officials, both pro and anti-fascist, Gestapo agents who pursued her relentlessly, refugees of every type, welfare workers, prisoners of war, swindlers and black market, uh, marketeers, Zionists and anti-Zionists. The list is long. We learn about Nellie Benatar through her encounters, her ways of dealing with people that reveal the outlines of her character. But about herself, Nellie was silent. 
She carefully tried to root out any personal emotions from her private papers, any hint of passion or fear or malice. Nevertheless, her feelings do emerge and we get a three-dimensional picture of her character. A person of iron will, generous, sharp as a scalpel, sentimental, a loner, adoring her family, yet willing to leave them for the sake of her sense of mission. Her silences are meaningful and I tread carefully among them, picking up bits of her consciousness and making of note what she said and did and what she did not say, trying to read between the lines and paying attention very carefully to what others said about her. Through this story in which she's the central actor, there are many other players who fill in the blank spaces I spoke of. At the end of the day, I think her story allows us to better understand how people of North Africa, people of Morocco, Jews and Muslims alike experience the war. It's also possible to empathize with them and to feel the injustice of the burdens that war thrust upon them. Still, I've left many of questions about North Africa in this period unanswered for others to follow me. <clears throat> Years of Glory is arranged in chapters that move chronologically from 1939 to 1945. This method underscores the intimate connection between big events in the wider world, global history, such as the fall of France or the retreat from the Eastern Front and the micro events that flowed from them uh, in the North African region. In 1935 and 1940, at the outset of the war, the narrative focuses on Benatar's search for a role to play in supporting the Allied cause. At the age of 42 and recently widowed, she took a nurse's training course in Casablanca and prepared to go to the front in France. The fall of Paris in, 19, in June 1940 aborted that plan and she had to find another venue for her desire to become involved and do something good. Suddenly in the summer of 1940, a flood of refugees engulfed North Africa, flowing out from uh, a falling, collapsing Europe. And the inability of the French colonial administration in Morocco to help them was immediately apparent. Benatar stepped up and single-handedly and organized a massive rescue operation for more than 2,000 people using funds collected from the Casablancan Jewish community. In 1941, she joined the newly formed Moroccan resistance. And this is a story never before told. The Moroccan underground centered in a print shop in Casablanca and slowly took shape in the years 1941 and 42. The resistance were made up mainly of foreign leftists and Jews and some Moroccan Muslims. This short lived effort was exposed and collapsed dramatically in 1942. Some of its people were captured and tortured, but Benatar miraculously escaped. In 1942 and 1943, migration through Morocco from Europe came to a halt as Europe became a closed space. The story now shifts to Benatar's cooperation with other aid agencies, such as the JDC and the American Friends, the Quakers, and the changing definition of refugees from unwanted to victims of war deserving protection and a guarantee of personal rights. Benatar's skills as a lawyer came into play in this period as she helped hundreds of homeless and stateless refugees to regain their personal legal status under the umbrella of UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration. Her role in liberating the Vichy forced labor camps in the Sahara is another important chapter in the book and it's brought out in full detail. Years of Glory embraces a spectrum of stories and themes that capture the devastating impact of the war on the peoples of North Africa, and especially on its half million Jews. So why does Benatar call those terrible years when so many were dying 
suffering, Les Années Glorieuses, The Years of Glory, the title of this book. This is the basic conundrum of our story. Benatar never openly addresses this question, but leaves it to us to understand how tragic events can either bring us down or can bring out the best in us. Benatar entered the abyss, struggled with it, and emerged feeling as if she stood on the side of right and good. In her view, the real challenge of the war was an individual one, testing one's ability to act with kindness and generosity. Nelly Benatar had no doubts that she had passed this test. I'd like now to introduce you to Nelly Benatar through photographs from the collection of Serge Lapidus, her son-in-law, who unfortunately died uh, three or four months ago at the age of 96, but helped me immensely with formulating uh, this project. Other photos come from the JDC and from the collection of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, generally, generously lent to me uh, for this book. Uh, I also have uh, images in this collection uh, from others who generously contributed them uh, from their personal archives. So let us go now uh, to the PowerPoint where I can show you these pictures. Here's a photograph of Nellie Benatar uh, and uh, taken during, just after the war. She's probably uh, here about 50, 55 years old. Her early years. This is the earliest photo I have of Nellie. It's when she graduated from the Lycée Mère Sultan in Casablanca in 1917. Nellie was born in Tangier, Morocco on the Northern coast. She was uh, the child of a well-to-do uh, upper middle-class family, I would say, um, who traced their roots back uh, to, to Spain, uh, as her name Cazes uh, indicates. Uh, she had a comfortable childhood uh, among uh, the uh, upper crust of Tangier's Jewish elite. She attended the uh, school of the Alliance Israelite Universelle, and by the time she graduated high school uh, in Casablanca, which was uh, quite a feat for a woman in those days, she knew at least four languages, uh, was well acquainted uh, with uh, history, uh, both European history and the history of the Jews, and with her fa father had become acquainted as well uh, with the continent as she traveled with her family uh, to Italy, to Spain, uh, and was a, a quite a, a sophisticated cosmopolite, uh, even at the age of 18 or 19. Uh, in the early 1920s, she married her childhood sweetheart, Moises Benatar, and this is a, a, an image of the young couple in their first years of marriage. Uh, Moises was a philatelist, a, a stamp collector and seller. Nelly, for Nelly, he was the love of her life. They settled into an apartment uh, in Casablanca, in the center of Casablanca, and began uh, raising a family uh, in the 1920s. Uh, Nellie and Moises had uh, two children, uh, a daughter, Miriam, uh, and a son, uh, Mark, uh, both born in the 20s. Suddenly in 1930, uh, Nellie, uh, an established, comfortable housewife, felt she had another calling. Uh, and she decided to study law. And it was possible in those days for uh, Moroccans to apply to the uh, university in Bordeaux for a correspondence course uh, in graduate studies uh, after the Lycée. And Nelly did that 
and she applied to the School of Law at Bordeaux. And through correspondence, by 1933, she had completed her degree and had the great merit of passing the French bar. Nelly Benatar was Morocco's first woman lawyer. And here she is in her judicial robes. Uh, she was a member of the Casablanca Court of Appeals. In 1939, uh, she, she was practicing law for six years. She decided to give up the law, her law practice when the war broke out in uh, September of 1939 and to devote herself in some way uh, to, to the war effort. Uh, so she took a, a nurse's training course at the Hôpital Colombani in uh, Casablanca and in the spring of 1940, she graduated with a, a nurse's uh, degree with a specialization in treating victims of gas attack. And we can see Nelly here, she's in this crowd of very young looking, happy young women and having, women having completed a degree. And she has her, uh, she has her usual or rather sober demeanor. She's at least 10 years older than everyone else here. Uh, in the nurse's training course that she completed. Her plans were aborted when, uh, uh, when the Nazis, when the Germans marched into Paris and Northern France became, uh, was uh, occupied by the Germans. Uh, almost immediately, a flood of refugees began to arrive in Morocco after the fall of France in June, 1940. And instead of uh, continuing her ambition, uh, to nurse uh, victims of the war, she decided to become a rescuer. And here she is with a group of uh, uh, refugees who were arriving in great numbers uh, at that time from, from France on ships uh, coming across the Mediterranean. Uh, and she's not in this photo, but these were the, uh, this is a photograph taken by uh, so some people who had arrived uh, on ships in the, in the summer of 1940 and really had no place to go. And Nelly was the one who organized a massive uh, operation to find them shelter. Another photograph of refugees uh, having arrived in uh, Casablanca. And in this photo, we do see Nelly. She's here on the left uh, with this group of uh, refugees. Uh, in, uh, in Casablanca. Uh, as you can see, they're mostly family groups uh, and she was the one who took responsibility for finding them shelter and food and a place to stay. All of them were in transit. And excuse me for a minute, I have to shut my phone off. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Uh, she was responsible for finding them food and shelter and a place to stay in their transit. Another group of refugees uh, who uh, arrived in uh, uh, Casablanca. This is a very a typical photograph that refugees took. They found, would find uh, a native, uh, an exotic, exotic looking native. And here you see this young boy uh, sitting uh, on the ground. Uh, uh, surrounded by refugee, refugee groups. Uh, the appearance of these refugees is interesting to note. These are not ragtag people who arrived with nothing. They're well-dressed, the women are well-dressed, and this first wave of, of people who fled uh, via Morocco, uh, we, we see a group of people uh, uh, that are uh, 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 well put together, uh, and uh, ready, uh, ready to move on. Another group of refugees uh, in Casablanca, uh, people would like to go out and tour in the streets. It was exotic for them to be in North Africa. Uh, and uh, here they are, the gentlemen wearing neckties, the women in high heels, uh, enjoying uh, the sights uh, of Casablanca. Most of these people did not stay very long in Morocco. Uh, they, they moved on uh, uh, very quickly on other, other ships. They arrived by boat or by train and moved on uh, to other destinations that would take them uh, to, uh, 
to safe harbors uh, in the West, uh, either in North America or South America. However, at this time, the numbers of people who were transiting Morocco uh, was, in, uh, was impress impressive. Uh, between two and 3,000 people arriving just in that summer of 1940 uh, from, from Europe. Some of them did not have the means to go on and had to stay uh, in North Africa, in Morocco. And so the French uh, administration quickly together with Nelly Benatar uh, created a transit camp near Casablanca. Uh, the place was called Sidi El Ayashi. It was an old uh, uh, military training base and uh, hundreds of refugees were housed there in the summer of 1940, uh, 1941, uh, we, uh, summer of 1940 into 1941. And we have a, a series, a remarkable series of photos uh, of life in Sidi El Ayashi uh, taken by um, the, the photographer uh, uh, Erwin Blumenfeld, who was a very famous photographer uh, in Europe before the war and uh, after his uh, arrival uh, in the United States uh, in 1941 with his family, uh, uh, he reestablished himself in, uh, in New York and became a, a premier photo photographer, especially for Vogue magazine. This picture uh, is taken in one of the, one of the uh, lodging places at CDL Ayashi, and it uh, shows the, the Blumenfeld uh, family. Uh, Irwin's wife and his children uh, here and here and here and, and a neighbor uh, to give you an idea of the conditions under which they were living in this camp. It was a transit camp. It was not a concentration camp by any means. <clears throat> conditions were acceptable, uh, but people were very, very glad to leave when, as soon as they had a chance to leave on a, a boat um, heading west. Uh, at the camp, uh, the, uh, the, 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 there were many young children, and uh, this photograph uh, also in the Blumenfeld collection shows the young kids uh, lined up outside the gates uh, of uh, the camp, Sidi El Ayashi, with a, a woman who was their, uh, their teacher, uh, uh, whatever, their watch, watch uh, caretaker. Uh, and here is, is very interesting because at this end of the photograph, you see Moroccan soldiers uh, who were guarding uh, the camp uh, and uh, uh, associating uh, with, with the inmates of the camp uh, in, in a sociable way. Uh, another uh, photograph of a Moroccan guard. The camp uh, was enclosed by a wall and there was barbed wire on the top. Uh, but the uh, people in the camp were uh, allowed to leave. They could walk uh, to the nearby town of Azamor and visit the town uh, and come back to the camp. So uh, they were semi-confined, uh, but they were also not prisoners. They were free to leave uh, at, at certain times of day, go to the beach and go to the nearby town. Other refugees didn't go to internment camps because they had um, the, the, the means uh, to uh, support themselves and they preferred to stay in, in Casablanca in rented quarters or very often in, in lodging that Benatar found for them. So we have some photographs of refugees <clears throat> in, this, in urban surroundings. This, is a photograph from the photo album of Sophie Freud. Uh, Sophie had a wonderful time in Casablanca the, as a refugee. Her, uh, her grandfather, the noted uh, Sigmund Freud, um, was her ticket uh, to a privileged uh, refugee experience. So she and her mother uh, lived in Casablanca for a number of months while they were awaiting uh, ongoing passage to the United States. And Sophie was 18 years old and she was she had a fun time. She writes about this in her book about her refugee experience. Uh, uh, she had a group of uh, young friends from uh, upper class Jewish families 
uh, as well as a very handsome uh, boyfriend. Here she is with her mother uh, uh, outside the walls of the old town, the Bedita, shopping uh, for souvenirs. Uh, also part of the refugee experience uh, was the finally getting on a ship uh, on the way to the Americas. And we have uh, photographs of refugees sunning themselves on decks of the boat, uh, looking very much uh, like tour, casual tourists in other uh, less fraught times. Uh, the Guinea was one of these ships that stopped in Casablanca and picked up uh, refugees and carried them across the Atlantic. Uh, it, it, uh, it made numerous, numerous tr uh, transatlantic crossings in 1941 and 1942. Uh, in the late 41 to 42 alone, over 8,000 refugees left Casablanca uh, for the New World. Most of them helped by Nellie Benatar and her friends. But not all refugees had an easy life or went to the beach. For many, the experience was extremely difficult. Uh, and I'm talking about uh, those in transit, uh, little money, uh, difficulty getting sufficient food, uh, the uh, uh, lodging was difficult, difficult to find. Uh, just making their way through uh, the day uh, presented enormous challenges. Uh, here we have a, a, a wonderful photograph from the JDC archives of a refugee in Casablanca uh, uh, selling neckties, oh, I'm sorry, in Tangier, uh, selling neckties to a, to a passing, uh, uh, stranger um, to, uh, to get money to, to survive. Benatar uh, came uh, in, into the breach and helped. She had endless lists of refugees who needed help uh, and she uh, tried to send them monthly stipends, um, usually the funds provided by the JDC. Uh, she knew where they lived and she would send them uh, uh, postal orders uh, that helped them. Um, to, to survive. Another topic that enters into this uh, story of Nellie Benatar is the, uh, the story of the Trans-Saharan Railroad called the Med Niger and the forced labor camps in the Sahara. Benatar learned about these forced labor camps in 1941, but she felt that she couldn't do anything about them at that point. These camps were essentially prison camps set up by the Vichy government uh, in France, uh, uh, where uh, ex-soldiers uh, ex demobilized from the French army in 1940, who were not French uh, uh, and not considered a desirable people to remain in France, uh, were exiled to North Africa uh, and uh, organized into labor battalions and put in, the, in various camps uh, throughout Morocco and Algeria to work on uh, pro projects that uh, further the war effort for Vichy. Some of these camps were more miserable than others. These were not camps where uh, the, the, the inmates, ex-soldiers, men, all men, were free to come and go as they pleased. The work was difficult. They were paid very, very minimal wages. The food was awful and they were under military control. And the camps existed from 1940 until early 1943 after the American uh, invasion, uh, American British invasion of North Africa. Uh, but for three years, uh, thousands of men uh, languished in these camps uh, doing uh, hard, difficult work. Uh, under miserable conditions. Most of the people in the camps uh, were Spanish, uh, ex-Spanish Republican soldiers uh, who had been demobilized from the French army, but there were numbers of Jewish men, mainly Central European Jews, who had volunteered either for the Foreign Legion or for uh, the French, um, uh, French Auxiliary Corps uh, in France who uh, found themselves imprisoned uh, when, the, uh, when France uh, collapsed, collapsed and sent to North Africa. Uh, and I have a number of uh, photographs of these camps 
1943, Benatar um, made a tour of these camps after the, liber after the liberation of North Africa. And here you see uh, where the camps were mainly along this railroad line uh, in Eastern Morocco that, uh, that moved from the coast down into Algeria to the coal mines of Algeria. Um, slowly, slowly, the purpose of these camps uh, became uh, apparent. Not only were they prison camps, uh, but they were uh, given uh, the mission uh, of producing uh, uh, raw materials that were transported along this railroad line to the coast and from there <clears throat> uh, to the southern European uh, ports. And according to my uh, archival sources, from there, much of this material that was uh, uh, mined in Morocco was sent on to Nazi Germany uh, to help uh, in the war effort. Here is a group of men uh, working on the railroad line, uh, constructing it and uh, sending it, uh, building it further into the south toward the coal mines of Kanadza. Uh, the main camp of this, uh, this world uh, of forced labor camps was uh, at a place called Bu Arfa uh, in uh, the south of Morocco, you can see it here on the map. Uh, it's quite near the border, uh, the Algerian uh, Moroccan border. And it was uh, uh, the central uh, organizing spot for work uh, on this, uh, the extension uh, of the railroad. The work was very hard. This remarkable photo from uh, the Holocaust Museum it shows uh, a man uh, working uh, in, uh, on uh, building the railroad uh, at a place called Imfut. Uh, another uh, exceptional photograph is this photograph taken uh, 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 in a tent at Bu Arfa, and it shows uh, some of the ex-Spanish soldiers in the tent uh, talking to uh, a, Jewish, a Jewish prisoner uh, where uh, they lived uh, together uh, and, and work together. And this is near Bu Arfa. The forced labor camps were uh, one genre of camp in, in camps in the Sahara. Another uh, were the punishment camps uh, where uh, workers in, in the, uh, the ex-prisoner workers who were recalcitrant, did not follow the rules, uh, showed some political inclination uh, were were exiled to the punishment camps. And these were truly horrible uh, places. Uh, we had uh, the, the luck and the good fortune uh, to be able to visit these camps, uh, my husband and I, uh, in 2016 with a Moroccan friend, uh, Abrahim Kassou, who drove us through this very, very remote place uh, in Southern Morocco to visit the camp of Ain Warak where we found almost intact the remnants of this uh, punishment camp where uh, uh, workers uh, uh, who uh, refused uh, to follow the rules were exiled uh, and spent times in total, total isolation and were in, in fact not only isolated but punished. And remarkably, the remnants of the methods of punishment were still uh, engraved on the grounds and the sand around the camps. This particular kind of excavation uh, was called Le Tombeau, uh, the grave where people were forced to lie down for days on end uh, with uh, no food uh, uh, to uh, in punishment for some uh, ref uh, breaking of the rules. And of course, numerous people died uh, in, in these uh, in, in this punishment camp. We don't really know how many. Uh, Bergent was another camp on the Saharan Trans-Saharan Railroad, and it was a forced labor camp built uh, uh, especially for Jews. Uh, this was a town about uh, 100 kilometers uh, from uh, Wijda, perhaps a little bit more, uh, from, uh, from the a city on the coast. Uh, and we also visited this camp and were able to take photos uh, of the cemetery uh, uh, left over from wartime uh, where some of the graves 
uh, were um, uh, marked, uh, I should show this, uh, marked with Hebrew writing. Uh, this is uh, the, the grave of uh, uh, Manny Abram Shapiro uh, from, uh, from Poland who died here in the process uh, of, uh, of his uh, of doing work. The job here at Bergent was to bring uh, stones from the top of the mountain here, you can see the, the crest, uh, down uh, the slope uh, to the bottom uh, where the camp was. And there the stones were broken up by hand uh, and sent along the railroad line to the railhead where they were used as ballast. Would you close my phone off, please? Benatar had a very big role in liberating the camps in 1943 after the Americans arrived uh, in, in North Africa. Uh, she used her lawyerly uh, skills uh, to make a case with the Vichy government in Morocco uh, to let the prisoners in these camps um, uh, go free. Uh, and she worked closely with the American occupation, army of occupation, uh, to win uh, a place for these workers, many of them uh, who were uh, 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 of Jewish or uh, Jewish origin, with to work with the Allies uh, in their uh, uh, in their uh, uh, depots and uh, collection points for for uh, goods uh, and military material on the coast. Uh, 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 there, there were over nine thousand refugees employed by the allies across North Africa, helping the allied cause as the Americans and the British uh, made their way across uh, North Africa, Tunisia, where they had the decisive battles uh, with the Germans in 1943. But Benatar arranged for these men when they were liberated from the camps to find work in Casablanca at the military bases uh, and uh, she also arranged housing for them and food uh, and even clothing together with other aid agencies. The Quakers were also very important uh, in the process of liberating the camps. Here's a list she made during her trip in 1943 uh, to, to the south of Morocco before the men were let go. Uh, and uh, an example of her uh, amazing uh, sense of uh, record keeping and organization. Uh, the name of these people uh, that she found in this particular camp, uh, the, the first name and last name, uh, their uh, nationality, uh, most of them were stateless, uh, but she nevertheless interviewed them, found out where they came from, their religion, Catholic, Israelite, you see, Protestant, uh, their uh, uh, profession, which was very important. She looked ahead and saw how this, this list would be uh, useful in convincing uh, American uh, army officials that they could, these men could be helpful uh, uh, of, uh, uh, in, in the war effort. Uh, and then, uh, then, of course, their location, uh, which camp they could be found. So this was a, an enormous effort in which she cataloged uh, almost uh, 500 men uh, and their eligibility uh, for work with the Allies. In 1944 and 1945, Benatar uh, was employed by UNRWA. The United Nations created refugee camps under their auspices in North Africa uh, in these years the first at a place called Fadala on the Moroccan coast and later uh, in Algeria uh, at Philippeville. Uh, Benatar was employed uh, in both of these camps and her job uh, at the camps was an important one of creating dossiers and extensive files for each one of the inmates rescued from, usually rescued from, from Europe uh, and setting them on the path uh, to reclaiming uh, their personal identity. This stage of their transition from unwanted prisoner, uh, prisoners in concentration camps to re people restored to life, a normal life, uh, was uh, helped uh, immensely by her uh, insight that creating new identities uh, for these people, uh, these refugees who had lost 
their old one, their, their statehood, their nationality, uh, and uh, instead treated them as individuals with individual trajectories uh, was an important and significant part of her war work uh, toward the end of the war. For example, there's a, 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 a certification for someone named Gerda Abraham, who was a, red, a resident of the Jean d'Arc Center at Philippeville, and this was her passport. This uh, uh, slip of paper that identified her and said she was a resident of this uh, UNRWA camp was the first step toward reconstituting uh, her personhood. And it was Benatar's work within the camps that uh, underscored the importance of recreating identities for people who had lost them. Post-war is not the focus of my book, but I'll show you a few pictures from that era because uh, in, in the post-war years, uh, Benatar went on to uh, other uh, work with uh, displaced people in Europe and, uh, and, and in Morocco itself as uh, the representative of the JDC in Morocco. Here she is uh, in 1954 uh, uh, on a trip to uh, the United States uh, where she spoke at length about the work of the JDC in North Africa and she met many dignitaries, including among them uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. And Benatar is here looking a bit dazed by her uh, presence here with the famous people. She died in 1979, uh, and I was able, uh, David and I were able through great effort, find her, uh, her gravestone in the Cimetière uh, Pantin on, on the outskirts of, of Paris, where this very simple uh, grave, uh, gravestone uh, marks uh, her, her place of rest uh, uh, with an impressive, uh, a wonderful uh, uh, sentiment marked on it. Our mother, a, a formidable legendary woman who helped uh, everyone in distress. Just a couple of pictures of my uh, research, finding the story. Uh, here's an interview I conducted with a gentleman here in his late 90s uh, in the town of Bou Arfa. Uh, in the south of Morocco, and the third person in the uh, in the photo is uh, my friend, uh, the Rahim Kasu, who accompanied us on this voyage to find uh, the locations of the refugee camps. This man, uh, although he was very uh, on in years, is still able to recount his experiences to me during the war. And it was interviews like this that gave me a sense uh, of the contours of the story, the richness, and the, the personal flavor that that made it uh, unique. Uh, another photograph of us uh, with a group of people uh, engaged in human rights work uh, deep in the south of Morocco in a place called Boudinib, uh, where the, the local committee of human rights activists uh, greeted us and took us to the site of an abandoned uh, military camp um, uh, that housed refugees, uh, pr political prisoners, during the war. And finally, uh, last but not least, a photograph of me uh, interviewing Odette uh, Charbit, uh, who was again in her upper 90s and was a friend, uh, acquaintance I should say, of Nelly Benatar. She's a bit younger, but in, in her 90s, very sharp recollections of war and, and how her family uh, endured it. Uh, in, uh, in Casablanca. Uh, she's living today, still in Paris, a remarkable woman uh, with uh, uh, a lot to say. So that's the end uh, of my uh, uh, PowerPoint. And uh, uh, let's go on to the next uh, phase of this program. Thank you so much, Susan, for a fascinating presentation. Isabel Rohr, Manager of Academic Programs and Outreach at the JDC Archives, will now join Susan for a conversation. 
Good afternoon, Susan. Um, yeah, good afternoon, Susan, and good afternoon, Linda, and to all of our um, friends um, who have joined us today um, to listen to Susan's presentation. Um, I first want to say how much I have enjoyed your book, Susan. Um, I think it's beautifully written, and uh, it reads like a detective novel. It's very rich in detail and in insight. So I personally have really enjoyed it. And I think it's a must read for anyone who is interested in the effects of World War II in North Africa and especially on the Jewish community of Morocco. So um, yes, re highly recommended to our um, audience members. Um, and also actually I've seen this morning that um, the book is mentioned in, a, um, in an Argentine newspaper, and I think the title mm -hmm. is um, The Moroccan Schindler. So that was a very interesting interesting um, title, Susan. I think it says, um, The Moroccan Schindler, a book reconstruct the story oh, of a forgotten woman who has saved thousands of Jews. So you've written a book about the Moroccan Schindler and we're waiting for, um, for the film probably. Um, so I will, um, I will start with my um, first question. Um, and um, I mean, as you mentioned, um, um, Nelly Benatar teamed up with the GDC. Um, how did she get involved with the GDC exactly? I think that started in 1940, right? Yes, yeah, so she started uh, her work with the JDC in 1940. Um, uh, uh, someone, uh, uh, after the arrival of all these refugees, uh, contacted the, the JDC and said, you know, there's something going on in Morocco. Maybe you guys can go there and help out because there are swarms of refugees from Europe in Casablanca that really need help. So the JDC contacted uh, Nelly Benatar. They had no idea who she was, but she already knew a great deal about the JDC. Um, uh, how she knew, I'm not exactly sure, but I think that uh, friends of hers in Casablanca, uh, who were very tied into international Jewry, uh, had told her about the JDC and their uh, and their uh, uh, charitable work. So the JDC contacted Nelly Benatar and said, "Here's five hundred dollars. Uh, we'll help you uh, help help you with your refugees." Well, Benatar was smarter than to take five hundred dollars. So she told them, thanks, but no thanks, we're doing okay, but I'll talk to you soon. And then within a very short time, she came back and had a long laundry list and a serious demand for funds from the JDC. The JDC thought it over. Uh, they had already been involved in some uh, charitable work with refugees in Tangier. And after a period of discussion among them, uh, not really knowing who Benatar was and wondering what her bona fides were, uh, started to help generously with the settlement, uh, with the work, refugee work, uh, providing money for allotments for support, uh, and eventually getting very much involved uh, in buying, uh, helping to purchase uh, tickets for passage uh, for uh, stranded refugees uh, to the new world. Uh, and I think they also, JDC also helped or, uh, with visas, right? Um, getting visas for refugees. Yes. Right. They worked with uh, ESAM, which is a European, a European agency, uh, played a very important role in, in uh, 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 transiting uh, refugees from Europe uh, uh, to, to safe places in, in the Americas. They worked as a team. All of them worked together. It was a and remarkable the cooperation. The person at JDC that she seemed to have worked the close, closest uh, with is um, Joe Schwartz, um, who was um, the, based in Lisbon and was um, the European, um, the, the director of European operations. Um, how, how was that relationship? Well, at first, I'd say it was a little bit rocky. Um, the JDC was not used to uh, dealing with women uh, of strong character like uh, Benatar, who uh, were not humble. Uh, she took charge and she uh, uh, was very straightforward in her needs and her demands. And she and Joe Schwartz were in a, a correspondence, but uh, they didn't really know each other. Uh, uh, eventually, Joe Schwartz in 19, late 1942 came to Morocco 
uh, uh, and uh, met Benatar. And I would say that they formed a very fast uh, and warm friendship from that point forward. And the JDC became uh, uh, very involved in what she was doing, particularly in the refugee camps that were formed in 1943, 44, and 45, uh, helping uh, generously uh, to uh, support the refugees and to help them uh, by, uh, by passage onward to, to other places. So uh, yes, yeah, so Joe Schwartz was an important person for uh, Delhi Benatar. And Nellie Benatar became an important person uh, for, for Joe Schwartz. She was the North African contact. The JDC quickly realized that there were half a million Jews in North Africa that would need help. Uh, even during the war, that became apparent to the JDC, and they saw it as a rich field for further uh, activities once the war was over. Right, but it's through the help um, that they provided to the refugees in Casablanca and Tangier that they became aware of um, the, the local communities, the, the yes. Moroccan communities themselves. Uh, for sure. Exactly. Exactly. That was their that was their uh, uh, entry, the footstep in. And I must say, the JDC stayed in Morocco and is still active there today. Uh, but for many years, was the most important source of funding for the Moroccan Jewish communities after the war. It was a, played a very important role uh, in the Jewish communal life in Morocco for many years. And actually, throughout the book, I was stuck by the fact that um, Benatar had. Um, she forged relation, relationships with individuals such as Joe Schwartz, um, who were who came from very different backgrounds. I mean, she forged close relationship to Vichy officials as well, um, to people in the resistance movement. Um, and one relationship that I thought was particularly interesting is the one she had with the uh, Resident General uh, Noges. Um, if you could talk a little bit about that, that helped her, um, you know, uh, dealing with the refugee question. Uh, yes, this is one of the most remarkable parts of the story of a story full of uh, remarkable episodes. Benatar became uh, acquainted with uh, Charles Noguès, who was the Résident General, the head of the French colonial administration in Morocco, mainly through her, his wife, who was a very influential woman, uh, Suzanne Delcassé uh, Noguès. Uh, who was also involved in refugee work. And through this connection with uh, Noguès, she had a kind of protector uh, because Noguès uh, was not a, a martinet. He did not follow to the letter the orders that came from Vichy in France to him about how to deal with Jews uh, in Morocco and other questions concerning refugees. He was the top man and he made the decision to allow Benatar to continue her work. He tried to protect her as much as he could without crossing uh, the Nazi operatives who were in Morocco and uh, poking their no noses in everywhere. And I've uh, told this story in the book. Her, her relationship with Noguès was very important. It was not known. It, didn't, it wasn't revealed until much later in 1956 when Noguès was on trial um, for war crimes, uh, supposedly collaborating with Vichy, and he was uh, uh, accused uh, of treason. And uh, he was on trial in Paris uh, uh, in, in the, in the, in the uh, Ministry of Justice. And uh, Benatar was called to testify on his behalf. And the transcripts of those trials exist. And when I read them, I was really my jaw just dropped because I began to realize the closeness of her relationship with no guests and how it was a key to her success in operating so freely in wartime Morocco, uh, that he was a kind of uh, protector who stood behind and made sure that she could do uh, what she needed to do. And, and I mean, this is particularly extraordinary given that she was in the resistance movement. Um, and, you know, was he aware that she was in the resistance? Was Noguès aware of that? It's very possible he was, because when the, that resistance cell that has never been discussed by historians, the existence of a, a Moroccan resistance movement has never been discussed in the sources. Uh, when, uh, when it was uh, uncovered, uh, exposed, and people were arrested, 
uh, Benatar was not among them, although she was uh, quite prominent and uh, could have been uh, easily identified. Uh, it's, a bit, it's a mystery why she wasn't arrested, but it's very possible uh, that Nogas uh, drew the line and said, leave this woman alone. I'm imagining that. I have no historical proof for that. But the fact she was uh, not arrested is quite remarkable. And, and in the book, you said that this was a secret, really, that even her, her closest family and friends were not aware of. Um, and I'm just wondering, I mean, most people who were in the resistance in Morocco were left wingers, as you as you mentioned, people on the on the left. And um, what motivated her? She doesn't seem particularly political um, uh, from from what I read in the book. So what was the motivation there? Correct. Uh, the presence of Jews in the Moroccan resistance is notable. Uh, when I come across lists of names of people who were arrested, people who were involved, um, they are, the Jews, both Moroccan uh, and European, are among them. We have testimony about what happened to the resistance and why it was crushed uh, from another amazing person named uh, El Kubi, uh, who was an Algerian Jew uh, who left also his personal archive uh, to the central archives of the Jewish people in Jerusalem. And in that archive, uh, El Kubi makes it clear that his own participation in the resistance, which resulted by the way in horrible torture, it took him months to recover, uh, was the fact that he was as a Jew responding uh, to, the, uh, uh, to, to the policies of Vichy uh, that separated and stigmatized uh, Jews and imposed race laws on them in Morocco that were very similar to the race laws that were imposed on Jews in France. So his resistance was one to that stigmatization of Jews uh, and demoralization. And I suspect that Benatar's motives may have been very similar. Uh, uh, she, uh, uh, she was a person who was governed by her conscience uh, and by her sense of what was just. And I think that this, uh, uh, this participation in the resistance was motivated by that. It also had a practical side because the resistance was involved in um, helping uh, soldiers uh, uh, who arrived in Morocco and uh, clandestinely to return to Europe to fight. And she arranged, uh, was behind uh, an escape route that left from Casablanca uh, to Gibraltar. Uh, and the information she used to manage that escape route came to her through the resistance, through information, uh, got, uh, the, 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 the resistance uh, network. So she had both a, a practical and a moral uh, uh, motivation in taking part uh, in, in this uh, activity. That part of the book is really fascinating because, as you said, nobody really knows anything about uh, her involvement. Uh, it came as it came as a big surprise to me, I must say. Um, th there's something you wrote at the outset of the book. Um, there's a sentence you wrote um, that really struck me. Um, you wrote about Benatar. She lived in three worlds: Jewish, Moroccan, and French, and she found pleasure and disenchantment in each. Um, I think this is a really striking comment. Um, and um, I was one, I mean, I think reading the book, I get a sense of what you mean, but it would be great if you could say a little bit more about it. Well, like many Moroccan Jews, she was a woman of uh, several worlds. She uh, was uh, Moroccan by birth. She was Jewish by religion. Uh, she was French by culture. Uh, she spoke. Uh, she was educated uh, in, uh, uh, in 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 the, in the French in a French school. She was a woman of, of diverse uh, parts. Uh, and if you would ask her what she was, uh, what was her uh, what was her identity, I think that she would perhaps had difficulty answering immediately. But uh, I have posed this question uh, to other women uh, of her type, uh, Jewish women, 
uh, uh, in Morocco, but not exactly of her generation, perhaps a little bit younger. Well, how do you identify? And the first word I get back is I'm Moroccan, I'm Moroccan. And then of course I'm Jewish and my culture is French. I suppose Nellie Benatar would have said the same thing, thing because the Moroccan Jewish identity was a very, very specific one uh, that was deep, uh, deep in her pores. And I talk a bit uh, about this, particularly the Sephardic identity and the connection uh, with, uh, with Spanish culture for the Jews of the North. Uh, of course, that's a very specific uh, group within Moroccan Jewry. Many Moroccan Jews did not have that identity, uh, but uh, uh, identified with different aspects of Moroccan culture, uh, didn't speak Spanish, uh, lived in other parts of the country. Their native uh, first language was Arabic, uh, and some even spoke Berber. But for her social group, where she grew up in Tangier, uh, her identity was a mosaic one uh, of different drawing on different cultural strands. And I think that was her strength, one of her strengths, her ability to operate in various levels and among different kinds of people. And I, I do think, I mean, as um, is obvious throughout the book is the frustration with the French, um, yes. with the French system that does not give any rights to, um, to the Moroccan Jews. I mean, I think you, you quote um, the historian Daniel Rive and you say, the, who say the Jews consider themselves stepchildren in the protectorate. Um, so it's, um, um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting also that identity, Jewish, French, Moroccan, probably shifted with the circumstances. At times she probably felt more Jewish or more French or more Moroccan, um, I, I, can, um, I can imagine. Um, there's something else that um, struck me um, is um, she was a very independent woman. She seemed to have had the space to really forge forge her own path in life. She married for love. Uh, she became the first licensed woman lawyer in Morocco. She pursued her own professional and personal interest. Um, so she basically broke the mold, it seems. And I, I'm wondering how was that perceived by others? Um, like, yes, how, how did, um, she didn't fit a certain, um, a certain type. Um, well, for sure, uh, you, you, she did break the mold. I think you've uh, hit the hit the phrase exactly. So she she was quite unique uh, in her uh, self fashioning, uh, in her aspirations, and in her activities. I mean, that's what makes her uh, such a wonderful subject for this uh, biography because she was uh, so unusual. It, uh, just simply. Um, by being who she was, uh, based on her her background, her her family status, uh, uh, her ability to operate at, at so many different levels, her self confidence. She was a woman of enormous self confidence, but also enormous doubt. There were times she confronted. Uh, I don't want to gild the lily here. She confronted opposition. There were people who didn't like her. There were people who wanted to confine her uh, and slow down her activities. Uh, and some of them uh, were uh, uh, people, uh, Zionists, for example, uh, who who didn't like her um, uh, lukewarm attitude toward a migration uh, to Palestine before the war. Uh, uh, people, Moroccans of her social class, were not thinking of mass exodus before the war. They were thinking of making things better for Moroccan Jews in Morocco. And she and many of people of her, uh, some people I would say in her immediate circle, uh, uh, supported her, but others didn't. They, uh, they became ardent Zionists and wanted to uh, propagate the idea of, uh, of leaving Morocco. This happened, of course, as we know, eventually after the war under very changed circumstances. But Benatar was very single-minded uh, about her sense of finding in each issue the core values of what would be fair and what must. And I think that was her guiding principle and it just kept her uh, in line personally and it wasn't always well received by others. Um, I, I'm 
I'm going to ask you one more question, um, Susan, because I see that we have a, bit of, a few questions from the audience and I want you to have a chance to answer some of them as well. So my last question is really simply, why did she leave such a sm small footprint in historical memory? Well, this is a, a small question, but a, a, with a big answer. I think we all know that women's biography has been the stepchild of historical uh, histor historiography, and particularly uh, in the Middle East and North Africa, where uh, one has to really look hard to find exemplary characters. Uh, uh, and uh, I think th this is, uh, historians have glanced over people like Nellie Benatar and not been uh, provoked to look for them. Um, on the other hand, uh, women historians uh, are drawn to a figure like this. And I was fortunate enough not only to see her name mentioned in a couple of the secondary sources, but then to discover her personal uh, archive. And this of course was the bait, the reason why I delved into the story because there were uh, many, many resources for reconstructing her life uh, during the war period. But women tend to be overlooked by, uh, by male historians. They tend to be overlooked uh, in the grand narrative uh, of, of North Africa generally. And uh, I think that that's changing very much. I think that there are, and now uh, the antennae are out and uh, these kinds of stories uh, are becoming, uh, becoming uh, uh, of great interest. We're moving into a new era uh, with this whole uh, uh, question of reconstructing the war uh, period in North Africa uh, and the Jewish role in, 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 uh, in it. And since I began my work 10 years ago, we now have a number of really good, important publications that try to, to fill in the gap. And, and I, I count uh, years of glory uh, among them. The fact that it deals with a woman uh, of extraordinary capabilities whose story isn't, wasn't really told it was just simply my piece of luck that I found it. Thank you, um, Susan. Let me ask you some questions from, um, from the audience. Um, questions can be sent via the Q&A. Uh, we try to get to a few, but we won't be able to, um, to um, go through all of them. Um, I see that we have a very specific question about a source, um, um, uh, Susan. Um, someone asked if there are re records available from Ein Shock. Uh, I might mispronounce, which you mentioned in chapter three. Uh, I haven't seen uh, records specifically from Aishak. This is a, 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 an operation that Benatar uh, set up uh, to house refugees in 1940. I think it was re, uh, rehabilitated later. Uh, but, you know, her archive of 18,000 doc, uh, documents, 18,000, every one of them uh, uh, significant in one way or another, uh, contains loads of information uh, that I haven't even been able to um, process or touch uh, in, in this one story, uh, this, this narrative that, that I've created. And I hope um, that other researchers will follow and come after me. They now have a guideline to her to her activities during the war um, and, and find um, um, new data, new information. Almost every day I find in my email a, a question from someone who somehow had a connection to this story of refugees asking me for some uh, precise bit of information uh, uh, from the data. And all I can say is the, the record is there, uh, go look, find yourself uh, and the question, answer to questions that may be your own particular family history or someone that you, you know and love and want to know more about their wartime experience. It's all there waiting for to be discovered. Um, so we have a, another question and we have is, could you please tell us what countries most of the refugees in Morocco in 1940, 1945 were from and what proportion were Jewish and what European ports they arrived from? From. Uh, yes, this is an important question. I, and again, uh, the uh, totality of information about refugees, we, we tried to compile lists uh, uh, that were found in the Benatar archive. 
to get a general picture of the refugee, refugee population in Morocco and what percentage were Jewish. My impression is that she alone processed between seven and 10,000 people, she alone. And I would say at least a third to a half were Jewish uh, and the other half were uh, uh, political refugees, ex-soldiers, uh, various people who were not, uh, not Jewish. Uh, it's uh, very difficult to get an overall picture. The French were not standing on the docks uh, with computers taking a account of everybody who got off a ship. Uh, there were so many people that entered Morocco clandestinely across the border uh, and transited Morocco during the war. We don't know who they were. Uh, they, they passed like shadows in the night. So an, an accurate count of refugees of their religious affiliation, uh, how long they stayed, where they went. These, these are not uh, uh, possible to, uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, pronounce about, but we can speculate and we can say at least half the refugees who came were Jews from uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, and, and many of them uh, had uh, left Germany uh, and Poland, uh, Austria in 39, 38, 39 and went to France and tried to find uh, refuge in France. And of course, we know in 1940 that that ended and they had to flee France. So these were people that moved out of their homelands in multiple stages. Uh, and uh, Morocco was just one of many ways um, that they fled, uh, fled Europe. There were other routes through Spain, through, uh, uh, to Portugal and so forth. Uh, uh, but uh, Morocco was one of several, several places. It also helped many Spanish Republicans, right? It seems many Spanish Republicans who uh, uh, fled to France in, in 1938 after the collapse of, uh, uh, of the revolution uh, of the Spanish Republic, I should say, Republican cause, uh, were in internment camps uh, and then uh, uh, were, entered the, the French army and then were demobilized as, and sent to North Africa to prison camps. Uh, there were also Spanish Republicans that came directly and crossed the Straits and came to Morocco. And those very often were political refugees people who knew that if they stayed in Spain, uh, they would be um, imprisoned, perhaps killed. And Benatar became involved with them as well. And there is a section of the book where I talk about her defense uh, of Spanish uh, political refugees in Morocco uh, and where she used her connection with Nogues to protect them and give them asylum. I think I'll just ask you one more question. Um, did, did Benatar express any opinions on the US diplomatic recognition and relationship with Vichy from 1940, 1942? Did that relationship facilitate refugee flight to the Western Hemisphere via Morocco? Uh, the question is, did she express anything, anything any about opinion about the US? That the US recognized uh, about the US. Vichy and whether that relationship between Vichy and the U.S. Um, facilitate um, the, um, the flight of the refugees from Morocco to, um, to the Western uh, Hemisphere. Yes, well, the U.S. was playing a, a, a very uh, multi-sided game by staying in touch uh, and uh, declaring its neutrality. Uh, up until uh, Pearl Harbor, after uh, the, the U.S. representatives at Vichy, as far as I can remember, um, were no longer particularly active. But Robert Murphy, who was the U.S. representative at Vichy, uh, knew about Benatar and knew about her rescue efforts. Uh, Benatar was a very pragmatic person. She was not uh, a, a, an ideolo a, a ideologue. She did not uh, stay away from people because their uh, political opinions were, were she did not share. She had one thing in mind, which was to get the job done. She had close relationships with the U.S. consul uh, in Casablanca in 1940 and 1941. Uh, his name was Herbert Gould, and I do write about him in the book, and he probably was an undercover uh, person uh, helping, helping her uh, get information uh, for her uh, uh, for her work with getting uh, 
fatigue and zoo contacts with all kinds of people if they contributed to her ultimate goal uh, of rescue. So I think uh, there's, there's no question that she probably dealt uh, very directly with, uh, with uh, the US government officials. Thank you. Um, thank you, Susan. I see that Linda is, um, is here to, um, to give some, some closing remarks. Um, I, think, I, I think it was fascinating and um, thank you for taking the time to answer all those questions, Susan. Thank you so much, Thank um, you. Susan, My pleasure. for a very interesting presentation and conversation. I hope you've all enjoyed our program today. Thank you for joining us. I want to extend our gratitude to Linda and Jerry Spitzer for endowing the Helen Cohen Memorial Lecture. The second program in the series on Jewish women in turbulent times, changes, challenges, and opportunities will take place on January 27th. Melissa Clapper, recipient of the 2001 Fred and Ellen Lewis JDC Archives Fellowship will talk about American Jewish women serving the JDC abroad during the interwar years. The invitations will be sent out in early January and you will also be able to register for the program via our JDC Archives Facebook page. We hope that many of you will be able to join us. Thank you very much. And before we go, um, I would like to remind everyone that information about Susan's book is in the chat, um, the title, and I think a link to the publisher. Thank you.